everybody. Welcome to another episode of The Executive at the Bio Conference, the CEO and Investor Conference in New York at Times Square. Very excited to be joined by Molly Harper, Chief Business Officer of Synlogic. Molly, great to have you here. Thanks so much, Matt. It's great to be here. Why don't we just kick off with what Synlogic is doing, what your team is up to, kind of yeah. stage you're in, and just share a little bit about the company. Absolutely. It's a really exciting time for Synlogic right now. So Synlogic is the leading company advancing biotherapeutics based on synthetic biology. And for folks who aren't familiar with synthetic biology, what that is is applying engineering principles like programming to biological entities, which can be organisms or enzymes or genetic circuits. And synthetic biology is something that is applied throughout many different industries, industrial and agriculture. And Synlogic is really the leading company who's developing potential new drugs, potential medicines based on that platform. And when you talk about developing drugs, what phase are you in now? Is it yeah. phase one, phase two clinical trials? Actually, all of the above. Okay. So Synlogic <laughs> is really remarkable. Synlogic actually is a full clinical stage a pipeline at this point. Uh, we were founded in 2014 out of MIT, out of the two world's experts in synthetic biology. We're an Alice Ventures company. And since that time, we've advanced now to having um, an asset or a, a drug candidate that's heading into phase three in the first half of this year. And then in the port, and just now in the fourth quarter, we had two additional positive data readouts. Another one was for a program um, in a homocysteine area which just announced proof of mechanism data, and that was in November. And we're advancing that program, and the next step there would be phase two. And then we also had proof of concept for an additional program. That was a phase 1B study, and that's for secondary or enteric hyperoxaluria, which is a really well-recognized cause of recurrent kidney stones. And that also would have additional work between that phase 1B and next step being a, a two, additional phase two or additional work prior to a registrational study. But on top of that, we also have an, uh, a program for gout in IND enabling studies. And we even have additional preclinical work in immunology, specifically IBD. Yeah. So it's a, it's a very, very busy time, and it's an exciting time. It's a logic. How, how do you manage all those different drugs in the pipeline, all the different programs you have going on? How, how do you manage all that and make sure you're, you know, you're putting your focus where it needs to be? Because it, there's a lot of different things going on. Yeah, that's a great question. First of all, obviously, I am one of a you know a, a larger team that is, of course, managing all of these uh, various programs. You know, I think the key, the, something that we talk a lot about at Synlogic is just prioritization and goals. You know, each of these programs has you know is, is their own ind independent program, but they also do benefit from tremendous synergies across the across the platform. I think that's what's really remarkable. People are used to hearing about synergies and platforms, whether it's gene therapy or RNA-targeted therapy. But our particular approach, uh, each of these candidates, each of these potential medicines that I mentioned, they're all based on what we call the same chassis, the same probiotic entity, which is E. coli missile. And that actually allows us to have remarkable learnings across the programs, which allow each of them to move unusually quickly and unusually uh, with unusual amounts of efficiency. So that's a big part of why we are able to um, have you know, have such the progress we have had to date. Yeah, and, uh, just hearing more about your role as the chief business yeah. officer. Can you explain what that is? As a sure, chief business sure. Officer it's often, absolutely, on. absolutely. So my world I think of is three different buckets. So one bucket is business development. Uh, we actually currently do have uh, two partnerships in research stage. We have a preclinical program with Roche, which is based on a single target collaboration. We also have a collaboration with Ginkgo Bioworks. But also given our... Um, you know, the, how advanced our clinical stage portfolio is. We obviously are always speaking to, you know, potential uh, collaborators who might bring useful synergies to those programs. So that's business development. The next bucket would be external communications, which of course includes corporate communications, investor relations. And obviously I work really closely with our CFO on that. And then the last bucket is actually closest to where most of my career has been, which is what could be considered commercial planning or commercial development. And that's really the, the function, ensuring that our program teams and our development plans as they're developed are always looking to the future and kind of with that end goal in mind, which is what will this do for patients? How will this actually um, you know, be a business and address the medical unmet need? 
uh, as you know, healthcare is delivered today. So that third piece, you're really trying to figure out how do I connect the science to making sure that there's a business around the science. That's exactly right. Yeah. yeah, that's exactly right. And a lot of the time, it's you know, in our industry, it's called the commercial perspective. But usually, really, what it comes down to is really understanding how clinical practice is happening in today's world or what the world will be like when that particular drug becomes available. So what are the options? What will the next options will be? Uh, what requirements will patients have in terms of how they want to take that drug? Um, what endpoints are going to be really important for the FDA, for doctors, and for payers? Those are all parts of the commercial perspective. So for you, you you've got to obviously manage everything internally, right, and know what's going on there. But you also have to manage a lot and understand what's going on in the external environment, whether it's macro trends or really uh, maybe very specific things that happen in hospitals. How do you, you know, make sure you're keeping up to date with all this information, whether it's internal or, or external and what's going on? Sure. Well, I think anyone in my position does a lot of the same things, which is, you know, um, keeping track of news and the industry and the companies and the peer groups you watch. In our case, we're in um, such a variety of therapeutic categories. You know, we're obviously tracking those those companies and not just those companies, but the science that's emerging, you know, from labs or academia or whatnot. But the other piece for me, and this kind of goes back to how I came through the industry that's really important, is getting out there. Yeah. Is getting out there and getting to clinics and uh, meeting clinicians, talking to patients. So I've spent 12 years in rare disease uh, commercialization and companies focused on rare diseases. And there is nothing like, um, you know, meeting the families. Um, and, you know, in times like during COVID when that was more challenging, connecting with clinicians who could really tell you um, on a on a, on a very um, personal basis, what it's like to live with and, and work with um, a particular disease. Well, that probably gives you such good data to go talk directly to the patient, but it also probably really drives you back to what's the mission? It's them, right? Yeah. It really brings you back to that. It really does. You know, it absolutely does. So, for example, let's take our lead program, um, phenylketonuria or PKU. You know, if you were to Google it, um, you know, and, and someone doing a cursory look would say, okay, well, it looks like there are already drugs approved for PKU. But it doesn't, you know, you just have to dig a little deeper to see that actually the vast majority of patients in the United States and around the world are without a medical option due to the, the limitations of those drugs. And the diet is excruciatingly difficult. It's so difficult. And this is the kind of insight we really learned from talking to patient leaders that it's not unusual for families to have to be separated because of how difficult it is to support a child with that diet, financially, organizationally, et cetera. Yeah. And you know, it's hard to imagine anything more tragic, but those are the sorts of insights you can get from actually speaking to um, members of the community themselves. So on that mission, it's easier maybe for you because we're talking to patients directly. But how do you keep the team really focused on this is the mission, this is why it matters? How do you keep people? Yeah, well, so I think Synlogic, you know, I joined Synlogic in um, uh, late 2021, and the company had existed for, you know, seven years by that point. And, uh, you know, I think from the very beginning, that was really central to Synlogic, and that was great because, obviously, when you join a company, part of it, a huge consideration, the most important consideration is the culture. And it, in some ways, the word patient-centric is almost a Sometimes it can become a cliche in our industry, but I will say that from the beginning, you know, our CEO, Eva Brennan, she was the chief medical officer originally, and that was a huge part of the culture that she set forth from the beginning as the lead physician at the company. And, you know, it, it made a huge difference for me to, to join an organization that had already established, you know, trust, um, respect, and, you know, very solid relationships with the patient community. Yeah. It really comes from the top. So you're also on a couple boards. Yeah. Can you talk about that? Maybe even starting off with how do you get on a board, right? How does that relationship happen for a lot of people that want to serve on boards? Sure, sure. Yeah, that's a great question. I'm on two boards that are actually quite different. So one is Catalyst Pharmaceuticals, which is a publicly traded company with a um, approved and a very successful therapeutic fear DAPs um, for patients with a, a very um, uh, um, a very devastating disease um, known as LEMS. And I'm also on the board of a very different privately held company called um, Precise Diagnostics, or Precise DX, which is an AI pathology oncology oh, wow. company. So they're very different. Um, but I think the biggest picture is probably, you know, two things. One is thinking about your career experiences. So 
in the case of Precise DX, the first company that um, I joined the board of, you know, that was a company that was coming, uh, it was just sort of coming out of stealth mode. And uh, someone I, a former colleague of mine, was an invest, had been an investor, he had led uh, its initial round. But what he knew about my background and reached out to me about is because I had a very entrepreneurial experience. Um, I started my career in Big Pharma, Merck, as big as it gets. Yeah. But subsequently, um, at one point, I was the second hire of another company. So I was literally, um, you know, kind of employee number three. And so I had that experience of kind of literally, like, where do you go, you know, from here? The other piece is that while I worked at Chenzyme, I was the general manager of U.S. Endocrinology, and part of my role there was actually managing a um, – pathology-based joint venture, which was around diagnostic and cancer for, with a company called Verisite. So that call, that former colleague of mine remembered that experience. And so I think that speaks to just the example of, you know, at that, you know, looking back 10 years ago when I was man, you know, managing that joint venture, I wouldn't have known how, you, you know, that would yeah. have led to a board organization, but it was a very different type of experience. I hadn't done anything like that before. Um, so I think it speaks to just rounding out your skill set, going for as many um, kind of diverse and challenging experiences as possible. And on the flip side, um, for Catalyst, that was a more formal experience. They had retained, um, they had uh, gone through a formal search process. And in that experience, they were specifically looking for somebody with that orphan uh, commercialization experience. And given the 10 years I had spent um, between Genzyme and Exia Therapeutics and rare disease commercialization, going through both, you know, successful and less successful yeah. uh, experiences, but then also foundations. It was, it was really that experience that we're looking for and appreciative of. And how do you approach your board roles? How do you see yourself as involvement in the company? More as advisory, very, you know, hands-on type of, you know, a board member? Like, You know, I, I think that's, um, you know, it's, that's uh, it completely depends on the situation. So yeah. this, in, in these two examples, they really couldn't be more different. So when I joined Precise DX, we were actually engaged in one of the most fundamental things you can do, which is searching for a CEO. And then in the case of um, Catalyst, I joined it at the time where the company had been through um, really tremendous achievements and, you know, it was already cash flow positive on this remarkable drug that has almost an instant, you know, an incredibly rapid effect on, on patients' daily lives and quality of life. So. In one situation, um, you know, it's, it was very much roll up your sleeves and, you know, talking to the executive chairman on a regular basis as we were interviewing candidates. You know, on the other, on the, um, the other, on the other, it's certainly learning. And, you know, I provide perspective from, um, uh, you know, as I mentioned, my orphan commercialization experiences. But it's, you know, it's, Catalyst is an extremely high-functioning company. <laughs> and do you use those, you know, board uh, director roles to help you in your current role as the business officer? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, I think that it's always important. And, you know, I've, I've learned this from many of my mentors. It's always important just to be out there and learning from others in your industry, from other industries, you know, having coffee, um, you know, catching up folks, being in places here. Yeah. And, you know, I think a board is just one more way of doing that. You obviously get deeper insight into a company per, um in, in ways when otherwise, but I, I put them on the same continuum as, as just, you know, staying connected with people you know or, or making new connections with people in the industry and learning from them. I'm, I'm curious because it seems like you're doing a really good job of this, learning constantly about what's going on out there, staying connected to people, while I'm sure your to-do list is, you know, a thousand items long. How do you make sure that you're still doing those other things and continually learning when your to-do list of what needs to be done today is so demanding and so long? Yeah, you know, I, I guess I would say, well, first of all, I think like a lot of people, it was more challenging during the COVID, yeah. you know, during the COVID era. And, and even now as we're, you know, a lot of us are hybrid, it, it isn't, um, you know, as natural as it was, you know, 10 years ago or, you know, five, six years ago or whatnot to, um, to regularly connect with folks. Um, but I think it's just about kind of building into the the uh, peripherals or the interstitial spaces of yeah. your life, right? So you have your your day job to get things done, but you know something you can always do. You know, one, one thing we do at um, uh, you know, at Synlogic is we have you know we have standing company all company lunches, and I find that that's a great way to bring other people from Synlogic or sorry from the Cambridge yeah. uh, biotech ecosystem. We say, hey, let's catch up. We have lunch at our place. Come on over, right. you know that sort of thing. And just connect different yeah, just, minds. Exactly, and see what whatever that you know, yeah. Just, yeah. But you do have to, um, it is so easy to have your um, day fill up that, you know, for me, I, I did learn from a mentor of mine who was, 
you know, she, when we were doing goals for the year, she said, you know, put it in your, you know, making your smart goals to, you know, reach out to X, Y, and Z numbers of folks who have gone through what you're about to go through, something like that. So I think there are formal and informal oh, ways of doing it. Yeah. So that's one of your goals is to reach out to so many people. Well, yeah, I guess I, that's, that's something that helped me in the past. Yeah. You know, it was really having managers who were very explicit about it, kind of yeah. instead of just sort of saying it casually, saying, you know, you you know, let's, let's put this in your annual objectives in that's terms awesome. of learning from others. Yeah. yeah. That's a good way to do yeah. it. Yeah. Uh, also because you've done this long enough and have seen, I'm sure things work and ebb and flow roller coasters yeah. in business. What have been some of the pitfalls you've seen in life science organizations to avoid as you build some logic? Yeah. Um, that's a really, that's a really great question. You know, I think, um, that's a really good question. So I'd say from, you know, an, an organizational perspective, you know, there are a couple, there's a line that says that like cliches are cliches for a reason, right? And I think that, you know, something we talk a lot about about some logic is teams, you know, and culture. And, you know, we, we are very intentional about having time when people come together yeah. to, uh, and it started, of course, it goes back to the company's culture since before, you know, I was there. But we, you know, we've always had a regular coming together called commensal. Um, you know, during COVID time, as an executive team, we stepped up, you know, touch points to just, you know, as a forcing functions for those communications. We now, um, you know, given, you know, the hybrid work dynamic, you know, we have once a quarter, we call it hub week, and everyone in the company is in the company, is there. And, you know, I think those... I'm, I'm definitely a believer that you cannot err on the side of over communication yeah. or rather if you do, the worst that will happen is people might get annoyed. Yeah. And if you, but if you err on the side of under communication, then you can have misalignment, right? Right. The misalignment, you can, it breeds mistrust ac accidentally. Um, so I think that I'd say that's, that's the biggest thing is being really intentional about communication. And I think that, uh, you know, Synlogic really does a great job of simplifying that. Yeah. Well, as we wrap up, in, instead of adding, you know, ending on any pitfalls and you know communication or um, getting people on islands, but what has been maybe the best advice you've heard in your career that has really stuck with you? Yeah, you know, um, actually, I think the best advice I received that it wasn't even necessarily advice, but that shaped my career actually came from my mom. So my mom is actually a clinical social worker who had an incredible career as a mental health administrator, but. She was very clear with me that she was very strategic about the foundational skills she got early on that helped her later. And for me, you know, early on in my career, I'd say you know, kind of two experiences I had that really have, that I use on a daily basis. You know, one was I spent a lot of time in deep analytics. I worked on Wall Street as an analyst, and I worked in Merck's, you know, data analytics and insights group. And on the other extreme, I also did a sales rotation in primary care sales, carrying the bag yeah. in the streets of San Francisco, you know, in Chinatown, in the Mission. And you know, those two experiences are very, very different, um, but they're very foundational and they're very core. And I, I rely on both of them on, a, on pretty much a daily basis. Yeah. So I guess uh, that's being strategic and kind of thinking early on about those, um, you know, kind of core foundational skill sets and how they can help you later on. And that came from my mom. Yeah, I love that. Well, that's a great way to end. <laughs> Molly, really appreciate you taking the time. Absolutely. Really excited to see what your team builds with Synlogic. And uh, thanks so much. Enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you, Matt. It's great to be here.